This evening, we're uh, closing the series by looking at Titus 2.14. So if you'd please turn in your Bibles, we're just going to read a few verses in Titus, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 14. And may again the Lord grant us his grace and mercy as we read his word, that we may receive it as his word, and may he also give us grace to receive what he has for us this evening. This is what Paul writes to Titus through the inspiration of the Spirit. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. May the Lord bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now again, as I mentioned before, we do want to uh, do a little bit of review in, in the end. Uh, Greg has kind of previewed uh, that, uh, that for us just a bit. But I wanted to see some of the things we've seen, because I'm, I'm sure that we've lost by now even the memory of what we've looked at. I mean, after all, this is the 20th uh, sermon in this series, so we've probably forgotten what we've seen at the beginning. But we began by looking at what is true of us if we have, in fact, trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we've tried to review this um, often to uh, remember that this is not just a principle, but it is a reality. The Lord says that we have died with him when he died. We died to sin. We were freed from its power. And actually, it doesn't have the power to command us any longer. That's very important when it comes to the idea of sanctification, when it comes to putting off our sins. We don't have to obey sin, but we do have to obey righteousness because we were also raised with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have his life within us now. We have the power to obey. And also we've seen we were raised up and seated with him in the heavenly places. And we know that that is our home. We know that's where we're going to be. And we also know because that is true, that is where our heart and our desire is now. It's not in this world, not to live according to these worldly desires and things that the people of the world do, but rather to live according to that standard that we know is followed in heaven. Again, as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, ultimately his goal is that we would all do what is done in heaven. Well, that is our desire because we've died with him and risen with him. We've also looked at several motives why we should put off our sin and put on righteousness, not the least of which is the fact that God has loved us with infinite love. We do need to remember the, the pit, as it were, that he dug us from. You and I were deserving of hell. Now, that's what we deserve. We didn't deserve life, but we deserve judgment. But God sent his son, the one most precious to him, to pay an infinite price in order that we might live. And he did that because of his infinite love. That love should move us to put off the things he hates and to put on what he loves. Such love, as we also saw, commands love in return. The Lord would have us to love him. Now, one thing we did see that I'd like to remind us of this evening is the fact that even though God himself cannot be made any happier by our love and obedience to him because he's already infinitely blessed, what we do does make a difference in our Lord Jesus Christ because he's not only God, he is also man. And as man, he can be more or less happy and he is more or less happy depending upon what we do. And so realizing that um, our actions will have some effect upon our Savior and upon his precious heart, we should love him enough to do everything that is possible to increase, as it were, his happiness through a life of obedience by putting off our sins and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing to move us is the fact that as we look at these things, we're not talking about fairy tales. We're not talking about legends or you know different uh, religion that some man made I mean what the Bible tells us is true 
And these things are real. Heaven is a real place and hell is a real place. And the Lord tells us that if we put off our sins and put on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we live obediently, that that is the evidence that we are spiritually alive and that we are going to go to heaven. But it also reminds us that if we are not putting to death our sins by the Spirit of God, that we will in fact die, which means we're already spiritually dead, but we will also have to face eternal death. So if we believe what the Bible says is true, which it is, we will die to sin and we will live obedient lives. We've seen several commandments also to do this very thing, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, which of course he is worthy of, to set our mind upon heaven and not upon the world to the degree that our hearts are captured by this world to that degree it will weaken our love for the Lord. And again, you know as well as I do, especially when it comes to zeal, which we're looking at this evening, we're only going to do God's will as far as our heart moves us. We need to love the Lord more if we are going to obey him more. We saw that we were commanded to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for our flesh with regard to its lust. I mean, we are to take care of ourselves, but we are not to allow any sin. We are not to allow ourselves to engage in things that tempt us, that weaken God's grace in us. We are to put off every sin universally and put on every commandment as submit to every commandment. And of course, we've just finished looking at the many things that God has given to us to strengthen that love and grace that is in our souls. Actually, we've seen it expounded over you know, several years at 52 uh, meditations at, at a time and sort of summarized it down uh, into those different means of grace that the Lord has given to us, that God has given to us prayer, a way to, uh, to talk with him and to call down his help and the Lord would have us to pray constantly, to pray according to the will of God or to, according to the word of God, to pray these promises and believe, to pray in faith knowing that God hears us and he will help us. We've seen that we are to use the word of God. We are to read it and apply it in faith, again, because it is true. We've seen the importance of worship, not just worshiping the Lord on the Lord's Day for an hour and a half in the morning, perhaps an hour in the evening, but to worship Him with our whole lives. Remember, we have died to ourselves and we are alive now just to serve Him. The importance of fellowship, of sharing that love the Lord has given to us for each other and that care which we have seen again this evening, sharing and bearing one another's burdens. That gift of faith to encourage one another that these things are in fact true and we see them making differences in one another's lives. And of course, using those gifts the Lord has given to us to build up the body. We looked at the Lord's Supper and how it is a reminder of his love, of the fact that we died with him to sin and of course that we need to look to him daily for spiritual nourishment and baptism, which we saw last week, which was first of all a picture of what it is that the Spirit of God is able to do if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is to take Christ and apply him to us and to wash away all of our sins, to wash away our guilt as a seal, that if we've trusted Jesus Christ, God has actually placed his mark upon us, and he says that we are cleansed, we are in Christ, we are safe. And as a mark of ownership, that the Lord owns us, and because we belong to him, we need to give ourselves to him. Again, that's just a summary of what we've seen over the last 19 weeks. This evening, we want to look at uh, one last exhortation to press forward. And that's simply the reminder that Paul gives us again in his word or in, in the word of God as to why Jesus came into the world why he lived the life that he lived, why he died on the cross. And basically he tells us he did this for three reasons. First of all, to redeem us or to free us from every lawless deed which we have committed. Secondly, to purify us that we might be his own possession, that he might own us. And thirdly, to make us zealous 
for good deeds. Now, again, the point is that this is why Jesus Christ came into the world, that this is the effect that he intended, then we need to examine ourselves to see whether that intended effect is actually coming about, whether we are uh, not only doing good works, but whether we are zealous for these. That is the, the end for which the Lord tells us to put off our sins and to put on Jesus Christ that we might become like him. He was certainly zealous for good deeds. Now, first of all, Paul tells us that Christ came to redeem us from every lawless deed to set us free from those sins that we have committed from that guilt. You need to realize that in God's eyes, uh, when, when we came to him, when Jesus Christ, of course, came to us, really, we had, as it were, a very long rap sheet of charges that were laid against us. I mean, every sin that we have ever committed, beginning with Adam's sin, because we are guilty of what he did in the garden. And sins that we don't even think about are sins. I mean, when, when we were conceived in the womb of our mothers, uh, our soul was also present, and it already had a disposition, and that disposition was against God. I mean, we already hated him from the womb, unless we happen to be one of those rare individuals that was uh, already regenerate in the womb, but that's not how most people or most Christians who eventually will become Christians come into the world. When we were born, that disposition of heart continued, and we expressed it. I mean, all of us who have children, we know what that's like, and we know what it was like for us to be children. We know <clears throat> there was that sin. And in our childhood, in our adulthood, every inclination of our hearts, every, every thought in our minds, every act, every word was really contrary to God until the Lord saved us. And realizing that every single one of those offenses was an infinite offense in God's holy eyes. And any one of those was enough to condemn us to hell forever. We see that our rap sheet, our predicament was a grave one. But Jesus came into the world to free us from that guilt through the sacrifice that he made on the cross. He has washed us from every stain of sin. The Bible says if you trust in Jesus, not one spot, not one blemish remains. He's taken away those filthy rags and given to us robes of clean white linen. So Jesus came that we might be holy, that we might have a spotless righteousness that was necessary to be able to enter into heaven. He has given to you a clean record. But Jesus Christ also came for a second reason, and that was to purify you for himself, that you might be his possession. Now, as I've already mentioned, your condition originally was sinful. You had a sinful heart. All you wanted was evil. All you did was evil. Paul tells us in Romans 3.12, there is none who does good. There is not even one. All the even outwardly good things that you did were done with a impure intent. You might say these good works had the veneer of good, but they had a heart of evil. We were like the Pharisees. You know, they might appear outwardly good, and there are some people who do appear outwardly good, but inside are full of corruption and dead men's bones. Jesus came to cleanse your heart. He not only came to clean up your record, but he also came to clean out your heart to make the inside clean so that the outside would become clean as well. Again, that's what baptism pictures and seals, that washing of regeneration that cleanses away guilt and renews the soul, making you want to do what is right. Jesus came to change your heart and to set you free from lawless deeds. We do need to be reminded that what Jesus came to do is not what a lot of Christians think that, he can, that he's come to do, which is basically just to give you the clean record. He certainly did that. He paid the price to God's justice, and he has set you free. He has redeemed you from hell, but he's done more than that. He has broken the power of sin in your heart. He has come that you might not continue to sin, that you might not continue to rebel against God that you might not continue to hate what is right and to hate God, but 
rather to love him. The Bible says that if we are going to live with God for all eternity, that we have to be like God. We not only have to have our sin and guilt removed, but we do have to have a change of heart, a change of disposition. We need to be like him. Jesus came to break the hold that sin has on our hearts. So he came to clean up our record, and he came to purify our hearts. But the end result was this, that we might be zealous for good deeds, that he might change our focus in life, that he might change our aim, that we would begin to live for him and be useful to him. Now, again, this says a great deal about the idea that one can be a Christian and yet not change. They can be a Christian but yet not obey, remain the same, remain in a rebellious state, and still go to heaven. You know, I don't know how many Christians there are that believe or how many churches teach that if a gospel appeal is made and you come forward and you pray the prayer, that that act somehow saves you and that that act alone is all that's necessary for you to go to heaven. You can go on living the same kind of life that you lived before and have absolutely no change of life. I think I've uh, told you that uh, there are those who believe that you can even go as far as to, to remain an enemy, become even worse of an enemy, spend the rest of your life trying to tear the church to pieces, everything you can do to drag Christ's name through the mud and so forth. And you were still saved because you prayed that prayer. I mean, after all, isn't it true that if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that you'll be saved and you'll be saved eternally and you'll never perish? Well, that certainly is true. But you need to realize as well that many have prayed that prayer but still did not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because that act of trust is a gracious act that the Lord must give. He must change the heart and give us a genuine desire to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you haven't trusted in him, it doesn't matter that you prayed the prayer, you're still guilty, you're still in your sins, and you will still go to hell unless you repent and trust. John tells us that no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Jesus came into the world, Paul says, to free you from every lawless deed, to take away your guilt. He came to purify your heart. He came to make you zealous for good deeds. In other words, he came to change your life, to turn it around from rebellion to obedience to begin to do the things that God actually commands, that he lays out in his word, that you would do his will on earth as it is done in heaven. Now, if we just focused on doing what the Lord commands us to do, I think we would have pretty much have our hands full, wouldn't we? I want to just uh, think about this for a minute because... This is the reason why the Lord came into the world, is that we might be the kind of person that he describes in the Bible, that we might do the things that, that he has called us to do in his word because these are the things that actually advance the kingdom of heaven. Not to do things that we might think are good things to do and nice things to do that might lead people to Christ. The Lord wants us to do things his way. And the reason why I say that is because there are so many churches today who have pretty much given up on doing things God's way and are trying to advance the kingdom of heaven through other means by doing things he has not necessarily commanded because they think those are good things but are leaving the things he has commanded undone because they don't want to do those things because they're uncomfortable to do because we don't want to witness, let's say, to neighbors and friends and to tell them of their sin and danger, the church does other things hoping to attract people to Christ. Maybe have a day where we love Modesto and go out and clean up the city and make it look spanky new. That way we attract people to the church because they like the things we're doing. We've done something sort of benevolent. Or 
Maybe we focus on the saints and we try to build them up and make them super saints and we, we build so much Christian community that we really don't have time to do anything else. Well, I guess you know, we're doing God's will and this is a good thing, so we don't really have to do those other things. We'll leave that to someone else. Uh, there was a church that we went to years ago that decided that they wanted to reach out to their community and so they decided to do a fundraiser to raise money to buy new uniforms for the football team for the local high school. And I thought that was a pretty good thing to do. And maybe the people at the high school would think, wow, this church is really trying to help us out, so why don't we help them out and we'll, we'll go to that church. Well, again, that's not what the Lord has called us to do. He doesn't say anywhere in his word that he wants us to clean up the city physically or that he wants us to you know, be so involved in the things we're doing inside the church that we never get outside or to buy uniforms for the local football team. What he wants us to do is the works that he has called us to do. He wants us to do good works as he defines them. The Lord has really told us what to do and even how to do everything that he has called us to do to his glory. His will isn't secret, it may be difficult, but it's not secret. We just need to pick up the word of God and read and then do what it says. Practice righteousness. That is why the Lord redeemed you. Now realize as well that God not only wants you to do good works as he defines good works, but he wants you to do them in a particular way. He wants you and me to be zealous for these good works, zealous in doing them, not avoid them and not make substitutes, but to do these things because just doing good is really not good enough. I think we'll all recognize that there are degrees of effort that one can put into something. I mean, one might be driving forward with all their strength and giving all that you have to give, or one could do it perhaps dragging their feet having their heart just slightly moved with some love for the Lord. Remember what we saw, it wasn't in the context of the series, but we did see it not too long ago. It was on a Sunday evening, as I recall as well, and uh, also had a talk with the gentleman about it because he had a difficult time understanding this. But in God's eyes, there's a great deal of difference between one who is zealous for him and one who is lukewarm for him. Remember what the Bible says about zeal. The Lord says uh, to the church that he would that you be either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. In other words, be zealous for me or have nothing to do with me, but don't be lukewarm in these things which are of infinite value, that are infinitely precious in the eyes of the Lord, because the Lord says, if you are lukewarm in these things, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, one thing we need to realize is that can't be true of a true believer because the Lord would never do that to a true believer, which means that every true believer has something of this heat, something of this, of this zeal that the Lord wants us to have. We are going to be hot. Now, again, none of us are perfect. We all are, in, well, we're in a world which is imperfect, and we have corruption in us. And as we've already seen through this series, there are going to be things that are cooling us down or at least attempting to, but there is going to be that secret oil that the Lord gives to us to keep that fire burning and to keep it hot. Another thing we need to bear in mind, too, is that this heat, this zeal can look different on different people. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's going to, well, express itself according as the Lord has made us. Not all of us are really, you know, uh, highly energetic people. Some of us have a lower level of energy. And heat or zeal is going to look different on each according as the Lord has made us. As a matter of fact, when you see somebody who has a great deal of energy and he is on fire for the Lord or she is on fire for the Lord and they have this great zeal. I mean, they pretty much make everybody else look lukewarm. But it's, it's not that the others aren't hot. It's really a matter of the heart. 
It's not the, well, it, it is going to affect the amount of activity, but it's going to be consistent with the kind of person that the Lord has made us. What he wants is a heart that is on fire for him. And so bearing these things in mind that this is the goal of redemption. This is why the Son of God became a man. This is why he came into the world and lived among sinful men. This is why he obeyed his father perfectly. This is why he went to the cross and went through that torturous death as well as having our sins laid on us and faced the wrath of his father. It was that he might uh, free us from our sin, from our guilt. It is that he might purify our hearts. It is that he might make us zealous for good deeds. Now in light of that, we really do need to judge ourselves. You need to ask yourself, are, you know, where is your heart at? Are you hot for the Lord? What, you know, I think there's some simple ways that we can, we can do this. Ask yourself, for instance, what is it that excites you? What is it that your heart goes after? Because whatever that is, that is what you are in love with. I think we all know what it is it should be. It should be the Lord, but sadly, it's not the case with many of us. And it's not necessarily because we're not converted. It could simply be because we are dabbling in things that we shouldn't be and we have not yet learned the lesson that the Lord is trying to teach us as far as stoking the, the furnace of our hearts. You know, sadly, many professing Christians get so excited when they talk about the world. Again, remember what it is we looked at uh, this morning with regard to um, what Thomas Watson had to say, how lively are many when they are about the world, but in the worship of God, how drowsy. I mean, so many professing Christians get so excited about the world and worldly things, but they can hardly work themselves up to do anything spiritual. I mean, they can't get themselves to read the Bible. They really can't get themselves to pray that much. It's, a, it's difficult to come to public worship but they love watching television. They love going to movies and to sporting events or amusement parks or concerts or whatever it may be because those things are fun, but they don't find the worship of God to be fun. Now, what does that say about one's heart if that happens to be your condition? And how does God look at that? Well, we struggle to spend time with him, the one that we claim to love more than anyone else, but we run after the pleasures of the world and of the flesh. I mean, how is it when somebody says to you they love you, and I'm thinking about, let's say, a husband and wife relationship, but they, they keep going after other lovers. We would say, you might say you love me, but do you love me? You know, the Lord likens our relationship to him as a, as a husband and wife relationship. And he often said of Israel that she was always going after other lovers. She was an idolater. She was an adulteress. And the Lord put her away for her adultery eventually. The Lord wants his spouse, his bride, to love him and to love him most of all. We need to be zealous for him. And the way that we show our love for him is through a life devoted to him, a life of worship. And so ask yourself this question, do you do good works? Are you about those things? Is that the focus of your life? And are you zealous for good works? Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem a people zealous for good works, not some who would barely be able to get themselves to do any good for themselves or for others. So this, this evening, consider the condition of your life. What are you like? And consider what it is that the Lord calls you to be like. He calls you to be zealous for his glory. And then one last thing you should consider is the shortness of time. You know, Paul tells us that we should redeem the time. We, when we see temporal markers, when we see another year of our life at a birthday go by, or if we see the, the new year go by and we think another year's gone by, what have I done with that year? And realizing that we only have a few of these years in which to do anything, considering the shortness of your life, what are you doing with it? Are you redeeming the time? Are you taking opportunity while it's still 
day knowing that the night is coming when you're not going to be able to do anything else. You know, the Bible continually reminds us, the Lord reminds us, that we have just a very brief window of time in which to show our love to the Lord and to show it to the world in order that the world might be saved. What are you doing with that time? And what should you do? Well, you need to remember what the Lord calls you to be. Why it is he redeemed you, that you might be zealous. You need to repent of indifference and renew that vision of God's love. Stoke the love that the Lord has put within your heart using the means of grace and press forward. Now again, one thing that I believe Jay Adams said, and, um, and I think it, it, it's, it would be helpful at this point, is we can get into a rut we can fall into bad habits, and bad habits are hard to break of, again, not getting into the Word, not praying, not using the means of grace, not getting busy in serving the Lord because we're used to going a particular way. And you know as well as I do that it's, it's hard to break those patterns. I mean, we, we listen to a sermon and we, we hear something that resonates with us. We, we say, that's a good thing. And I want to do that, but as soon as it's over, we forget and nothing changes, but we continue to live just exactly the way that we have lived before. We need to break out of every rut. We need to, to break every bad habit that we have and develop new ones. Jonathan Edwards, very early in life, again, wrote these resolutions. And the one that I keep coming back to is, is one that we would all do well to live by. And, and again, no one does it perfectly. But he said this, resolve to live with all my might while I do live. In other words, not to waste time, not to live half-heartedly, not to live in you know, a lukewarmness, as it were, but to be hot for the Lord, to be zealous for him. If you look at what he was able to produce or what the Lord actually produced through his life because of his willingness to serve the Lord, it's tremendous. The Lord did tremendous things through him, things that are still benefiting the church today. That's what we ought to be striving to do with our lives in that little bit of time that we have in order to serve him. Jonathan Edwards once just, just looked at a day and he says, you know, just, just consider one day. Consider if you were to give all that you had to give to the Lord and try to do as much good as you could possibly do in one day, how much good could you do? He believed you could do quite a bit if your heart was fully in it. But the thing is, day after day goes by and we don't fill those days with good things. But that's exactly what we ought to be doing. That is what Paul is telling us we need to be doing. That's why Jesus came into the world is that we would do exactly that. And again, by that, I don't necessarily mean that you drop everything you're doing and then just do certain things that, that in your mind, these are spiritual things. But the things that you are doing, you do as much as you, as you can. You do it to the glory of God as best as you can. You try to be useful to others. You try to love them. You try to serve them. You try to serve your Lord in doing these things. And, of course, let's not neglect the spiritual things either. But do those as well. The Lord wants you and me to be hot. He wants us to be zealous for good deeds. And so if that is not what we've been seeking to do, we need to repent and we need to go the right direction. We need to give ourselves to this. You know, as we, again, as we, we don't focus on these things, we don't make that the purpose of our lives, day after day continues to go by, time slips through our hands. Again, Edwards would remind us every moment of time that slips through our fingers is infinitely precious. And all the money in the world, all the wealth of the universe could not purchase back for us even one moment. And yet how much of it we let slip through our hands because, again, we have got ourselves into ruts and we're addicted to particular things we shouldn't be addicted to and we're struggling. The Lord calls us this evening to break free of that sin that so easily entangles us and to run the race with endurance, to press forward with zeal. We can only do that through the grace of God. So 
begin each day by praying before you get out of bed, Lord, give me grace to use this day for your glory and then set your heart in moving ahead with as much strength and zeal as you possibly can. Now again, realize this is only possible, of course, for believers. If, you're, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, then there's really no way you can do this and please him. You need to begin by repenting of your sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But once you've done that, every day is an opportunity to serve the Lord. The Lord wants you to serve him with zeal. And so seek to do all that you possibly can for his glory. Put your sins to death. Break free of them. He has, in fact, freed you. And if you don't think you're free, it's only a deception of the enemy. The Lord has freed you. You do have the power to turn, the, turn away from those sins and to break free of them and to do what the Lord has called you to do. And so put off those sins and put on Jesus Christ and use the day. Use the life he's given to you for his glory and his praise. This is why Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem you, that you might do this. And may the Lord grant us the grace to do this. And, and that this doesn't turn out to be just another sermon where we talk about things that we know we should do and things that are good for us and then turn around and do nothing about it. But let's pray that God would help us to apply the things that we have actually seen over the last several weeks and to change, to be transformed day by day from one level of glory to the next into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and ask the Lord to help us do that.